Ahmad Jamal, the head of arthroscopy unit, uh, and um, Dr. Yahya Bdeer, assistant lecturer in our department, uh, is now in the USA. Um, I hope everyone is safe. And we will begin with uh, Dr. Mohammed Jamal, who would give us uh, a talk about star repair in large and massive calf tears. You may proceed, Dr. Mohammed. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. I'm very happy to present today uh, the new technique of uh, modified uh, triple row repair. It's called star repair for large and massive rotator cuff tears. Uh, the arthroscopic approach to rotator cuff repair has become the standard practice for many surgeons. And this is because of the excellent visualization, less post-operative pain, and less morbidity. We all know the different types of cuff tears, starting from the I'm partial. Sorry, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, Mohamed, but your uh, presentation, uh, uh, hmm? uh, Ms. Zahra. Ega 2020 star repair or star yeah. publication or triple row with the illustration video. Allah, I'm going to ask you, you said to me, okay, Zahra. I'm going to ask you the screen that you did, and then you'll get out of here. No, no, no. Let's see that, okay, Zahra? No. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a slow share. So you deceived me. Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Again. Okay. Yes. Now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. The arthroscopic approach to rotator cuff repair has become the standard practice for many surgeons, and this is because of the excellent visualization, less post-operative pain, and less morbidity. We all know the different types of cuff tears starting from the partial tear with the reversal or partial or articular surface, small tears that less than one centimeter, medium tears less than three centimeters, and large and massive tears from three or more than five centimeters, and finally the irreparable tears. The main concern for the topic is the large and massive tears. Actually, large and massive tears are a true challenge because there is an endless debate and many surgeons favor only simple debridement with subacromial decompression. And the majority of these tears have now been treated successfully with arthroscopic repair. But the problem is the optimal repair strategy because of the retail rates reached up to 20%. There is a nice review article regarding the treatment of uh, large and massive tears with single row versus double row repair. And they found that the recurrence rate up to 94% with overall retail rate of 26% in the single row group. And the imaging proven retail of any type in the single repair group. From here came the idea of doing more strong repair techniques rather than the single row whether the arthroscopic double row or the suture bridge techniques. Actually, the larger massive tears as difficult to get the lateral portion of the cuff into an anatomic position that results in limited rotator cuff footprint contact area. As the medial row anchors are tight, the cuff is pulled and punched medially. And this explains the retear patterns justified by Trentalis that reported failure or the retear of the double row cuff repair medial to the medial row anchor at the muscular tendinous junction with a full fixed tendon on the greater tuberosity. This is how they retear. Again, with arthroscopic double row, not the suture bridge, Yamakudu reported failure at the medial row anchors with the sutures and not pulling through the tendon, causing impingement. Another review article that uh, showed type 2 retear after arthroscopic single row, double row, and suture, suture bridge techniques. There are, there are 14 studies were included 
in about 26 rota uh, 260 rotator cuff repairs. They concluded that the repair technique had a significant impact on the estimated incidence rate. They found that the double row and the suture bridge techniques increased the risk of medial cuff failure. So they reached the conclusion that modifications in the surgical techniques in both double row and suture bridge repairs can help to decrease that risk. Another also study showed that retail rates of 10 to 30% in a failure rate in double row techniques with higher rates up to 64%, especially in large and massive tears. Again, they concluded that there is a need for more effective repair strategy. So what is the solution? Because the large and massive tears is really a, a true challenge. So single row fails, double row and suture bridge techniques also fails, so the, maybe the solution is to maximize the rotator cuff footprint contact area that may improve the healing potential. This may be with the adding of a third row of fixation between the medial and lateral rows. This third row is tied before tying the medial anchors. Uh, Roger Strander in uh, 2012 make a, a, a study in 18 fresh frozen cheap shoulders with infraspinatus stairs and measure the contact pressure and contact surface area using a triple row modification of the suture bridge technique for rotator cuff. And he concluded that the average contact surface area was significantly greater in the triple row. And the average contact pressure was significantly higher also in the triple row with no statistical difference between the double row and the suture bridge group. Biomechanically, comparing the single, double, and the triple row rotator cuff repair in a Borkheim model, they showed that the triple row repairs results in a smaller gap formation, higher ultimate failure loads, fewer instances of tendon uh, tearing at the sutures, and highly secured footprint. So this is the actual double row when you suture in two rows, and this is the suture bridge when you suture the medial anchor and bridging the sutures to the lateral part. And this is the triple row when you're inserting a third row of fixation independent from the two other rows to decrease the tension in the constant. So this is the double row a schematic diagram, medial and middle anchors. This is the suture bridge, medial and lateral anchors, and the triple row with medial, middle, and lateral anchors. This is the originally described triple row. You can realize here that the triple row is independent from both uh, anchors. So why triple row? Because in the double row, you have anatomical footprint restoration, but no contact pressure. From here came the idea of the suture bridge technique that restores the footprint and do some compression at the rotator cuff to increase the healing. But it's actually the suture bridge, it is a double row from the configuration. Because if the medial row fails, the lateral row has no effect. But the triple row has a triple effect. First, the anatomical restoration of the footprint. This is the advantage of the double row. Better contact pressure, the advantage of the suture bridge technique, and the new tension-free repair, which is a unique feature of the a triple row construct. So this was the original double row. Uh, our modification of this triple row is the, called the modified link triple row technique, the star repair. Here, I describe the linking also the double row to the two knotless anchors to make a star configuration of the uh, construct. So we applied firstly the two medial anchors passing the sutures in a mattress fashion. Then the middle anchor, we, I applied only one suture color, it is a simple suture. And then finally the suture bridge using the sutures from the medial and middle together into the lateral uh, knotless anchor. In this configuration to end with this star uh, repair uh, construct. This is a case of massive cuff tear. 
And uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, video of one of the cases. You started with recognition of the tear from the articular side. This is uh, right shoulder. We operate uh, in a semi-sitting position. We start by mobilization of the uh, torn retracted uh, tendon. And in checking the reducibility of the, uh, of the cuff after doing the uh, mobilization. And usually in this case, I use uh, uh, make a bicep stenodesis with the, with the cuff. I prepare the footprint, then going to the subacromial space, doing uh, subacromial uh, decompression. Then shifting the scope to the lateral portal and working with the instruments from the posterior. You can see here how the tear massive is and uh, delaminated. Then application of the medial row anchors, starting with the anteromedial uh, anchor, which is double loaded. Then using the suture passing instruments to penetrate the cuff together with the biceps, passing all the four strands in a mattress uh, fashion. Taking the biceps with the cuff and then inserting the posteromedial anchor one to two centimeter away from the anteromedial one. Then using the suture passing in instruments from the posterior to penetrate the cuff and uh, taking all the four uh, strands uh, one by one, uh, penetrating uh, both layers and in some case and some uh, the other sutures in one layer. Then insert the middle anchor, which is a uh, called the reduction anchor or retention free anchor, just at the tip of the greater tuberosity and passing one strand from each color of the suture in a simple fashion through the cuff. This is a simple suture of the middle anchor. And we use this, this anchor to make a reduction of the cuff into the footprint without any tension on the medial anchor. And we suture this uh, uh, anchor and cutting one strand from the remaining suture of each color. Then we tied the medial mattress uh, sutures. And finally taking uh, uh, the strand, the medial and middle into the two lateral knotless uh, anchors one anterior uh, so the knotless anchor in the medial and middle together into the lateral one and this is the final see complete closure of the defect in a mattress fashion with complete closure of the uh, 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 cuff back to the footprint. This is from the uh, bursal side, from the subacromial view, from the lateral aspect, and then going intraarticular to check that uh, there is complete closure of the cuff back to the uh, uh, footprint. So this is one of the cases before the repair. And this is the final after complete closure with a star uh, configuration. This is the post-operative MRI of one of the cases. You can see the triple row repair of the massive uh, cuff tear. So why star uh, link triple row? In the original triple row, you can see here, once the medial anchor fails, the construct will depend only on the middle anchor, as if it were a single row repair. But in our modification with the star repair or in the linked triple row, the middle anchor is also linked and loaded to the lateral row. 
giving more construct stability and superior performance. It also allows further tendon compression, especially during humeral rotation. So we have the advantages of anatomic reduction of the rotator cuff back to the greater tuberosity, decreased dog air formation, greater contact pressures, more points of fixation, improved visualization when tying the medial row knots, and finally, highly secured footprint. So more effective repair strategy is guaranteed. The disadvantages is a little bit increased operative time and increased cost of the anchors. This study was uh, published uh, in the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine 2020 with under the title Outcomes of the Star Repair in a Large and Massive Cuff Tears, a Modified uh, uh, Triple Row Technique. Uh, so to take home message, with partial, with treatment of different cuff tears, with partial tear can do yes, single row. Small tear, you can do also single row. With medium tear, you have the option of single and double row. But with large and massive tears, either double row or the newly described star uh, triple row modification. Uh, this is because the large and massive tears usually need an extra row. So try the Big Mac or our modification is uh, with the star uh, repair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, for this interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I'd like to encourage the participants, if they have any question, you're more than welcome to send it uh, uh, to me uh, in questions and answers or in the chat, wherever you like. And then I would be more than happy uh, to present these uh, questions uh, to the speakers. So I think now we're going to move to the next lecture about the hemiarthroplasty, and that will be me. So, So now uh, I'm gonna talk about hemiarthroplasty and tips and tricks. So first of all, of course, in complex proximal humeral trauma, the displaced comminuted fracture and dislocation, they represent about five to 7% of all fracture of proximal humerus. And nowadays we have more and more older population. Therefore, we can expect uh, much more uh, of these fracture and the percentage is much more than five to 7%. So when we come to the indication of arthroplasty, we, we do arthroplasty in severely comminuted displaced fracture with or without dislocation and in case of osteoporotic bone. And if there is a vascular compromise, we're afraid of a vascular necrosis of the humeral head. And if we are afraid, if we do open reduction in fixation for such comminuted fracture, we may, be, we may be unable to restore or maintain the anatomy. And of course, in patient uh, um, motivated, should be motivated medically and for the rehabilitation after doing hemiarthroplasty. As for the contraindications, we cannot do such procedure in the case of uh, presence of medical comorbidities or if the patient has limited function demand um, or in young patients with valgus impacted four part fractions because uh, in such a case, open reduction term fixation would be better with the uh, uh, with no risk for avascular necrosis uh, in case of sepsis, of course. And if the patient will have difficulty to do rehabilitation afterwards. Preoperative planning is very important. So we start by taking a good history as regards social or pre-medical history and uh, neurovascular, of course, the status and the skin condition. And this is followed by the X-ray uh, trauma series, true AP and auxiliary, and of course, CT scan. Unfortunately, there are many classification, but uh, for this kind of fraction, but they are not always accurate because, because of poor reproducibility and uh, this classification, they don't mention anything about the bone quality. So it is ignored. And also uh, the patient factors uh, are ignored as well. As regard the imaging, we, we used to do conventional x-rays, of course, in AP and lateral. 
and we do a true AP to, uh, to show us the lesser and greater tuberosity. And it's difficult to do the routine axillary view because patient, of course, cannot abduct the shoulder. So we move to the Velpo axillary view, as you can see in the picture, uh, with the, the, the female patient uh, with the sling. And then, of course, this is followed by a CT scan because most of the cases, it's very difficult to, to, to see the configuration of the fracture and the degree of comminution and the extent and um, all of that. So we need to do a CT with 3D scan because to have a better information, better idea of this fraction, and how we're gonna treat them. Uh, as you can see here, the 3D uh, reconstruction of a fracture. As regard the implants, so the current concept, of course, uh, they started with the different uh, designs and different stems and the stem design to facilitate the proper placement and tuberosity fixation. So we, nowadays we prefer to place a low profile proximally uh, in order to have a place for the tuberosity to place them in a good position or, or, and also to, uh, to apply the bone graft in order to have a better healing and good healing of the tuberosity. Uh, not to mention the presence of anteromedial fins for proper tuberosity positioning and median lateral fixation holes uh, in order to fix the tuberosity to these holes with uh, non-absorbable sutures like uh, AT bond or fiber wire, water, whatever the kind of uh, suture that you like. And uh, some stems now have a gradation markings uh, uh, for positioning to give us an idea about the height of the stem when we implant it inside the medullary of the humeral canal. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, some pictures that show the stem uh, and the humeral head. And it's very important to determine uh, the height of the head and the size of the head. Usually the complications that we see in uh, such cases, they are due to poor planning preoptively. So as you can see in these x-rays, we have uh, poor uh, healing of the both tuberosities and migration, upward migration of the prothesis. Um, and it impinges the acromion, as you can see, with, uh, with failure and poor results. So uh, it's very important to know the height uh, of the stem when we place it. So the better procedure is to take uh, um, an X-ray of the contralateral arm to, uh, to have an idea about the length of the humerus. And just uh, we do an, uh, an X-ray of the fractured uh, arm and by subtracting this from that, we can know exactly the heart of the recesses where it should stop exactly. <clears throat> so this is an X-ray, as you can see on the right side, this is a, the normal limb with no fractures. And we draw a line from the upper head till the elbow, as you can see. And on the uh, contralateral side, I mean the fracture side, we draw a line from the fracture to the elbow. And now we have an idea that uh, where exactly we should put the stem at which height, I mean. So if you have a, a very good pre after plan, uh, the result, as you can see on the right side, will be, uh, will be good and the patient will be happy after that. So another thing, I'm sorry. So it's very important also to, to plan in the surgeon as, he, as we said, is more important than the prosthesis itself. So for successful techniques in, uh, in arthroplasty for fracture, or we can say that the key is to success. First of all, we have to preserve the deltoid origin function. And also we have to, uh, we have to make sure that the component is properly placed and fixed. So, um, so it means that uh, the proper humeral length should be maintained and not to, uh, not to forget to put the stem in an appropriate version. Um, when we come next to the tuberosity, it's very, very important that uh, the tuberosity should be placed in a, in a proper position and it should be fixed um, rigidly uh, in, in order to have a, a good healing. Of course, we can use longitudinal and transverse circumferential fixation, and that's uh, also, uh, in addition, put, of putting a bone craft uh, to enhance the healing of the tuberosity uh, to both to each other and to the humor shaft. So now we move preoperative assessments. So first, proper humor length. 
we, as I said before, we measure the opposite shoulder, we assess the bone loss, and the, we calculate the heart from the medial humeral cortex in order to have an idea exactly about the height of the stem. This is, should be followed by intraoperative measurement, and we have different techniques for that. So first, we, have, we, we, we should assess the intraarticular calcar loss. Uh, we may use the pec major tendon as a reference. Uh, we insert uh, the stem so that the distance between the upper, bo upper border of the pec major to the top of the head is about 5.6 centimeter. And this was published by Warner et al. And Krishner, uh, he showed us uh, um, something called, uh, he called it a Gothic arch, which is, which resembles, <clears throat> sorry, which resembles the chantal line in the hip. So the lateral border of the scapula should continue with the medial border of the humerus uh, as uh, a chantal line in the hip. So this means that uh, you have a good and proper position of the stem. As we said before, the pec major tender can be an atomic landmark to determine the humor length, and this was also published by Gerber itself. So this is an intraoperative uh, image when we use a ruler, as you can see on the right side, just from the upper border of the pec major till the top of the head of the prosthesis. I mean, uh, head of the prosthesis, so uh, to be between five and six centimeter, uh, and this is a good height of the stem. For the fracture stem positioning, there are many, many um, jigs to help us to, to, to just place the stem, either external fracture jig or intramedullary positioning sleeves. Uh, but all these jigs are awkward to use. And to tell you the truth, uh, it's very difficult to use them intraoperatively. And uh, I do not use them uh, because I find it, it's very difficult to use them. So as regard the surgical technique, of course, we start by regional general anesthesia, semi-beach chair position. We try to put the patient more lateral to allow adduction, external rotation of the humerus, which is needed during reaming and position of the stem, and et cetera. We begin by deltopectical approach. Of course, the first thing we look for is the long head of the biceps, which is our landmark. And then once I identify the long head of the biceps, I open the groove and the interval, as you can see, until I reach upwards. And then uh, uh, I deconstruct the fracture. So I put an elevator, whatever you would like to put in uh, inside the fracture site to just dis dislodge the fragments. And then after separation and isolation of the tibia. Uh, excuse me, uh, the, the screen is fixed, no moving of the slides. I mean, I would feel. I mean, I would proper humor lens. Oh. All, all, yeah, yeah, you have the same thing also? Yes, yes. I'm a afraid, i I'm i Okay, 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 come in. Yes, this is the last one, yes. Yeah. This is the this last okay. one, so okay, yes. I'll go back. Okay, so proper oh, humor yes. length, we, we set the intraoperative measurements, so we assess the intraarticular calcar, calcar loss uh, and the pec major tendon, we can use it as a reference uh, from the top of the pec major tendon to the top of the head, it should be between five and six centimeter as proved by Warner et al. And I said, Krishner, he just uh, mentioned uh, the Gothic arch intraoperatively, which resembles to the chantal line in the hip. So the lateral border of the scapula uh, should meet uh, uh, the medial border of the humerus in a line, in a congruent line, as you can see in the in the X-ray photo. Uh, so this is uh, an intraoperative uh, image showing uh, a ruler uh, that is. Uh, measures the distance between the upper border of the pec major and the, uh, the top of the humor head prothesis and should be, as I said, between five and six centimeter. Uh, this is a proper placement of the stem. Uh, I said before that uh, there are many jigs and they are awkward to use. I don't use them usually. So the surgical technique, regional general anesthesia, semi-beat chair position. We put the patient a little bit lateral to allow adduction and extension of the humerus. And then we start by deltopectoral approach. 
our landmark, as I said before, the long head of the biceps. Once I identify it, I open the groove and I follow the long head of the biceps till the interval and I open it. And then after that, I put uh, an elevator, a cup, whatever, to just de uh, dislodge the fragments. And after dislodgement of the fragments, I separate and isolate the tuberosities uh, from the humeral fragment and the shaft. And uh, I isolate the greater or lesser tuberosities with number five non-absorber sutures, or as I said before, fiber wire um, or orthocord or whatever. And then I remove the, the head, uh, the fractured head from inside. And I should take a look at the glenoid to assess the glenoid and the articular cartilage of the glenoid. After that, we ream canal to size, uh, and then we ream the jig guide to the height number. Uh, we we identify the number, and after that, we cement the size stem after, of course, suture placement. Prior to cementing, we should place humeral shaft sutures uh, for later reconstruction of both tuberosities. So, I just use. Um, either K wire of very small uh, drill bit to make holes in the humeral shaft and pass my sutures through these holes, medial and lateral to the bicepital groove uh, just prior to cementing. Uh, the proper version is between 20 and 40 degrees. And we usually don't use the distal bicepital groove as a landmark because um, as proven by T-bone in Journal of Shoulder and, and Elbow Surgery, that it may lead us to a, a false position. So uh, proper retroversion does matter as has been proven, proven by Boileau. As you can see in the three pictures uh, down there, if you just do a little bit more retroversion, and so during internal rotation, uh, there will there are going to be a tension uh, on the suture and disruption may happen. Uh, we can lose the good fixation of the uh, greater tuberosities. Uh, likewise, if we do uh, more antiversion, this can may, may affect the lesser tuberosity during external rotation. So as I said, the proper version is between 20 and 40. I usually like to put them in 20 degrees. And there is a reference, uh, we put a wire um, through the applicator and then we, uh, the arm is in 90, the elbow is in 90 degrees and just we make it parallel to this, uh, to the wire. Uh, as you can see in the right picture, we should be parallel to the forearm and we put it at 20 degrees or I put it in 20 degrees. After that, we cement the humeral component at the proper humeral height and version. We can use a cement gun or just your, your finger uh, to uh, put the, the cement inside the medulla. And of course, we should clean uh, the cement off the, um, off the prothesis, exposed prothesis. And usually I just remove about two or three millimeter from the top of the humeral shaft uh, to allow for healing of the tuberosities after fixation of the tuberosities to the humeral shaft. So I used to leave about two, three millimeter from the top of the, the humerus. Of course, we should assess the glenoid for damage, as I said, and the resected head should be, uh, should be uh, measured to determine the proper size of the head. And then we put uh, the dummy prothesis trial to uh, reduce it. And we should be able to do a 50% anterior posterior inferior override. And of course, when you put the arm in 90 degree abduction, the acromion should be clear. And after making sure that everything is good, we place the real humeral head component. Now we come to the most important part, which is uh, tuberosity reconstruction, which is very critical for proper healing and success. So the, as I said before, tuberosities must heal to both humeral shaft and themselves for proper cuff function, because if you don't do that, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a, a bad outcome. And all sutures should be placed before repair takes place, of course. And also don't forget to put the bone graft from the head fragments uh, inside the upper stem for, uh, to, uh, to enhance the healing of the tuberosities. So first I start by, uh, by fixing the greater tuberosities. I fix it to the humeral shaft and then to the fin of the prothesis, uh, utilizing a transverse sutures through the medial fixation slot of the component. And then I use a longitudinal suture uh, to fix it to the humeral shaft. 
the idle position of the greater tuberosity, it should be placed just below the top of the humeral head between six to nine millimeter, which uh, the many authors have shown that this is the be gives the best result. For the lesser, then I move to the lesser tuberosity and retouch it. The same thing with two transverse sutures uh, through the fins and also a longitudinal, I try to do a figure of eight. Actually, there are numerous techniques and suture passing techniques or suture passing methods to uh, at the end you have uh, you've got to have a good rigid uh, fixation of both uh, tuberosities uh, to themselves and to the humeral shafts. After doing all that, we should assess the stability and fixation of the reconstruction. So when we do internal external rotation of the upper limb, uh, everything should move as a solid unit. And then we should do abduction. I will make sure that the acromion is clear at 90 degree. And we should determine also the safe passive range of motion, just uh, uh, in order uh, to give um, the, the physiotherapist this number, I mean, the degree of uh, safe zone for rehabilitation. And this is very important. Uh, you should record, uh, register, the range of motion, which is safe in order to um, to tell your physiotherapist that this is the safe zone where he can move passively the shoulder. Just immediate post operatively, we do a passive range of motion within the safe zone of tissue tension. Water therapy <clears throat> when sutures out is very efficient, but unfortunately it's not present in our country. Most of the, most of the centers of physiotherapy don't have that. Uh, but actually hydrotherapy is very, um, very beneficial for the patient. Uh, six weeks later, we start active assisted range of motion. And at 12 weeks, we can start strengthening exercises. So as regards <clears throat> the results, it, uh, they depend upon the age, of course, less than 70s, completely different than over 70s. So over 70s, we prefer to move to a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, another another factor is the timing of surgery. It's better to do it uh, less than four weeks, and this has been proven by the work of Dines, Norris, and Krishnan, while all Burkhardt. Also, tuberosity placement and healing uh, are very crucial uh, for good outcome, uh, not to mention the humeral length or head height, I mean, and the head size, and also uh, a good retroversion. Of course, uh, the glenoid, as you can see, we should uh, follow these patients because with time, uh, this is a hemiarthroplasty. So it's just like uh, the hemiarthroplasty of the hip. After uh, several years, we can have uh, erosion of the glenoid and the patient will come and may need a revision uh, either to total shoulder arthroplasty or reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Thank you very much. So I think uh, now we, we're gonna move to um, to our last speaker, um, Dr. Yahya Bidir, who is going to give us a talk about the lateral offset in reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Dr. Yahya, hello, you may hello proceed. everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, thank you for both of your talks. These were great. Um, so. Can you see my screen now? Can you see my screen? Okay, yes, yeah. yeah. Yes, we do. Okay, uh, so I will talk about lateral offset and reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, so a little bit of history. Uh, uh, Charles Muir was the first to develop, to design and develop uh, shoulder prosthesis with the ball and socket geometry reversed. And this prosthesis had a fixed fulcrum shoulder replacement, uh, a fixed fulcrum unlike the native shoulder. And uh, this prosthesis had uh, an increased constraint uh, compared to the native shoulder due to the notched radii curvature. However, similar to the native shoulder, the center of rotation was uh, relatively lateral. And uh, this created uh, unacceptable uh, rates of instability and glenoid loosening. <clears throat> And then afterwards, many different designs also developed and in an attempt to reduce the complications uh, that happened with the near, near prosthesis. 
but also uh, all of these designs had lateralized centers of rotation and they had very poor outcomes secondary to the uh, unacceptable rates of granite loosening and instability. So poor results uh, remained until Paul Gramont in the 1980s developed his, for his uh, new principles in reverse shoulder orthoplasty. His first generation prosthesis had um, uh, an all polyethylene hemo component and the glenoid component was a, a glenosphere rather than uh, uh, a glenoid neck. So there was no neck in this uh, component. So the center of rotation shifted medially. And actually both components were cemented in the first generation prosthesis. And then the second generation prosthesis was composed of five components. The base plate was fixed to the glenoid with two divergent screws and a central peg, and it was uncemented. And the glenosphere was a hemisphere rather than two thirds of a sphere. So the center of rotation was shifted even more medial. So Gramont style prosthesis in general have a medialized center of rotation and a high neck shaft angle of 155 degrees, which is relatively high to compare to the current designs. Uh, the advantages of um, these characteristics is that this creates less shear forces on the glenoid implant interface. And also the abduction force required by the deltoid uh, is less secondary to uh, mainly two reasons actually. One of them is the longer lever arm and the second is longer moment arm. And it's important to distinguish between these two concepts uh, as they are very often used interchangeably uh, even in the literature. So the lever arm is, as we can see in the image, is the distance between the center of rotation and the point of, um, or the point where the force is applied. So here it's the deltoid insertion. So with distalization of the humors, the lever arm length increases. The moment arm, however, is the um, uh, distance between the center of rotation and the line of action of the deltoid, which is actually the deltoid fibers. So uh, with medialization of the center of rotation, the moment arm also increases in length. So with the Gramont style prosthesis, uh, there were a number of unsolved problems, including scapular notching secondary to inferior impingement, also instability secondary to impingement and slack rotator cuff, lots of external and internal rotation, again, slack rotator cuff, impingement, also less deltoid fibers medial to the center of rotation. So as we can see here in this image, and the native shoulder, the anterior and posterior deltoid fibers <clears throat> can potentially help with <clears throat> internal and external rotation if they are medial to the center of rotation. But when we shift the center of rotation medially, there are less deltoid fibers anterior and posterior uh, medial to the center of rotation. So um, uh, this would have a negative effect on uh, rotation. Also loss of shoulder contour uh, which is actually, uh, which used to be a problem with the medialized designs. Even if the if patients had reasonable functions, some people just did not like how their shoulder looked like. So scapular notching was one of the uh, main complications or drawbacks of the non-lateralized prostheses. Uh, it's very common, up to 96% in some reports can lead to glenoid osteolysis, loosening, and polyethylene wear. Some of the concepts or techniques that can minimize notching are center, so center rotation lateralization, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. Uh, other techniques include prosthetic overhang, decreasing the neck shaft angle, and inferior inclination of the base plate. So advantages of center of rotation lateralization include less impingement, including inferior impingement, so uh, less risk of notching. Also better range of motion, secondary to um, improved cuff tension, less impingement, and more deltoid fibers uh, medial to the center of rotation. Also better stability, again, to do better cuff tension, less impingement, and physiological wrapping of the deltoid. So uh, looking at this image in the, in the center here, uh, when we lateralize, so in non-lateralized designs, the deltoid pull is mainly uh, vertical. 
uh, and this would have a negative effect on the overall stability of the construct. On the other hand, when we lateralize the center of rotation, the greater tuberosity uh, becomes more lateral. So the deltoid pull, the deltoid tension becomes more horizontal, which is good for the overall stability. Also, uh, center of rotation lateralization can improve or achieve a more anatomic shoulder contour. So generally in reverse shoulders, uh, there's a combination of compression and shear forces on the glenoid. And generally in reverse shoulders, there's a fixed center of rotation. So uh, all force vectors consistently pass through this fixed center of rotation. So the shear forces here in this image uh, is um, demonstrated by this vertical uh, arrow. Uh, and, and the compression forces are demonstrated by the horizontal arrow. And the, this oblique arrow um, represents the combined force vector. So with non-lateralized designs, the combined force vector is relatively more horizontal because shear forces are, are converted to compressive forces. However, in lateralized designs or lateralized center of rotation, the force vector becomes more vertical. And this uh, creates undesired forces on the glenoid implant interface. And also when, uh, when this force vector becomes more vertical, it passes out of the glenoid implant interface. And this creates a new moment arm or, or a new torque that can further increase the instability in the early glenoid loosening. So disadvantages of the center of rotation lateralization, as I said, so shear forces on the, on the glenoid implant interface can lead to base plate and screw loosening, also glenosphere unscrewing and migration. Also with center of rotation lateralization, the moment arm length decreases. So the abduction force required by the deltoid increases. So the, the deltoid would need to contract more powerfully in abduction and this can lead to acromial stress fractures. So generally, center to achieve uh, the advantages of center of rotation lateralization, if we, are you, if we are lateralizing the center of rotation, we gotta make sure that uh, screw fixation is adequate uh, in the base plate. So there are two main techniques or methods to lateralize the center of rotation, either by implant design or by bone graft. Doing this by implant design is more accurate and uh, this can be done in, le in less surgical time. Doing this by bone graft, the rationale behind doing this by bone graft is uh, to lateralize both the center of rotation and the glenoid implant interface. And this would minimize the undesired forces on the glenoid implant interface. Uh, but this only happens provided that the bone graft heals and uh, does not resorb. And then comes humor lateralization to overcome the disadvantages of uh, all the previous designs. And the rationale behind this is to lateralize the tuberosities, improving cuff tension and improving rotational range of motion, providing a more anatomic shoulder contour and better stability while keeping the center of rotation non-lateralized. So the abduction force required by the deltoids remain, remains low. And also shear forces on the glenoid implant interface remain low. However, the effect of humoral lateralization on impingement and, and notching are either not very clear or depend on um, what the method of humoral lateralization is uh, used. So one of the methods to lateralize the humerus is uh, changing or adjusting the neck shaft angle. So a more valgus neck shaft angle like the Grimaud style prosthesis increase the acromiohumeral distance. So this allows for more abduction. While a more varus neck shaft angle increases the lateral offset, which minimizes the risk of notching and provides a more impingement free range of motion in actually all motions other than abduction. Also changing the humeral stem design can change the lateral offset. So a more curved design increases the lateral offset compared to a straight stem. 
Also, we can change the lateral offset or the humeral offset by using onlay designs. So onlay designs are those designs where the humeral tray rests on top of the humeral stem. These were first developed for easier conversion of anatomic orthoplasty to reverses. And the uh, lateral offset can be adjusted with the uh, with, um, onlay designs by placing the humeral tray eccentric on the humeral cut. So if we put the humeral tray medial, the humerus is pushed lateral, increasing the lateral offset. And the opposite is true as well. If we put the humeral tray lateral, the humerus moves medial. The disadvantage of this, of onlay designs in general, is that more bone, resect, more, more bone needs to be resected. Also, the modularity creates a potential junction for failure. And there are some recent studies that show that the risk of a coronal stress fracture might be increased with onlay designs. So as we can see in this illustration, putting the humeral tray lateral, it's actually not straight lateral, it's superior lateral versus inferior medial. So putting it superior lateral shifts the humerus medial or inferior medial. So this provides more acromiohumeral distance less acromial impingement and more adduction. On the other hand, when we put the humeral tray more inferior medial, the lateral offset increases with all the advantages of the lateral offset. However, putting the tray medial or lateral, anterior or posterior does not, like the tray position does not change relative to the glenosphere. So this has no effect on notching. So uh, this is uh, briefly, this is just a, a case to demonstrate how these concepts can be applied in real life. Uh, this is a revision case we did just uh, last month. So this is the x-ray after the index procedure. This was more than a year ago. Uh, a 65-year-old gentleman had a reverse orthoplasty and then came back almost a, uh, a year later uh, with a dislocation which was reduced successfully uh, in the ER. And then this was the post-reduction x-ray. And as we can see here, the humeral stem subsided and went a little bit into varus. And it is evident here in the AP and the lateral views that there's humeral uh, radiographic lucency uh, all around the stem in all zones, both in AP and the lateral views. Uh, Preoperative and intraoperative workup did not show any signs of infection, so a diagnosis of aseptic loosening was made, and the decision was made to uh, do a single stage revision of the humeral stem. So our goal in, goal in the revision was to actually one of the main goals in revision was to uh, improve the stability of the prosthesis. So in, in order to improve stability, we wanted to to increase the lateral offset uh, and also, of course, the distal tension. So to improve the distal tension, uh, we left the humeral stem a little bit more proud. And to improve the lateral offset, uh, we did two things actually to um, improve the humeral lateral offset. One is to, we inserted the humeral tray a little bit more medial. So uh, comparing this image to that, to the, the right image, to the center image, it's evident how the humeral tray rests a little bit more medial. It's not centered in the stem. And also we decreased the neck shaft angle. So uh, in revision, it was a 135 degree neck shaft angle compared to 145 degree neck shaft angle in the initial procedure. So this increased the lateral offset and potentially um, improved stability. So to summarize the effect of lateral offset on the deltoid. So the abduction force required by the deltoid mainly depends on where the center of rotation is or, or to be more accurate, it, it may, mainly depends on the length of the moment arm. So, uh, and this is best when the center of rotation is medial and the humerus is lateral. So with a medialized glenoid and a lateralized humerus, the deltoid is very happy. When the, when the glenoid is medial and the humerus is medial as well, it's okay, the deltoid is fine. 
But when the glenoid is lateralized and the humor, humerus is medialized or not lateralized, this is the worst combination for the deltoid. So uh, interestingly, the effects of glenoid and humor lateralization on abduction force required by the deltoid are opposite. And this has been proven in many, many studies. On the other hand, the effect of lateral offset instability mainly depends on where the tuberosities are. So with non-lateralized designs, there is high risks of high risk of instability due to the slack rotator cuff impingement and loss of physiological wrapping of the deltoid. With lateralized designs, whether it's humor lateralization or glenoid lateralization or both, uh, stability is very much improved. How about the subscap? So, um, why is it even a question whether to repair the subscap or not repair the subscap? So uh, we can see in the images uh, in the native shoulder, the center of rotation lies roughly in the center of the subscap tendon, while in reverses, the center of rotation is almost above the subscap tendon. So this creates an adductor, adductor moment arm of the subscap. So this antagonizes the abduction uh, formed by the deltoid. <clears throat> And also subscap repair can antagonize the posterior cuff and external rotation. On the other hand, subscap, subscap repair can improve stability, internal rotation, and minimize the risk of prosthetic infection. So how is that related to the lateral offset to this topic? So uh, with center of rotation lateralization, the, the abduction force required by the deltoid is already increased. So uh, uh, we don't want to make this even worse by repairing the subscap. And this is why some recent studies suggest repairing the subscap in a more superior position, like in the bicipital groove or even in the greater tuberosity in case the supraspinate is already gone in order to minimize the adductor force uh, that is uh, achieved by the subscap. So in summary, reverse shoulders are semi-constrained implants with a fixed and medialized center of rotation. Non-lateralized designs minimize shear forces on the glenoid and decrease the abduction force required by the deltoid. Glenoid lateralized implants decrease impingement and notching and improve range of motion. Humor lateralized implants provide a more anatomic position of the tuberosities while maintaining the non-lateralized center of rotation. Thank you, and I'm ready for any questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yehia. Um, actually, I have uh, one single question to Dr. Muhammad Gamel. Uh, one of the audience just asked you <clears throat> if supraspinatus alone, if there's a tear in it, but the rest of rotator cuff is intact, what is your optimal mode of repair? Single row or double row? Uh, yes, this depends on the size of the tear. If it is supraspinatus and uh, small tear, you can do it single row and it works very well. If it is uh, medium, it is large, uh, retracted, three to uh, three centimeter, it's my uh, medium tear. You have the two options, single versus double row. Uh, very rarely to be the massive tear with only one tendon. So you have both options, depends on the uh, size of the tear, quality of the tendon, age of the patient, traumatic or degenerative, but you have both options, single versus double. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Okay, um, question is to Dr. Yahya. So uh, do you prefer to do, uh, or, or in your center, do they do um, lateral offset? Uh, routinely, basically, I mean, uh, and they do they lateralize all uh, all the reverse shoulder. So uh, currently, actually, um, almost all of the reverses we do here, uh, we do we put wedges. So uh, there's a recent article by Boileau and and uh, Jill Vouch that uh, describes the reverse shoulder angle. Uh, that is actually, so the traditional method was to, um, in order to like measure the glenoid inclination was to draw a line between the superior uh, 
corner and the inferior corners of the glenoid uh, and um, compare that with the uh, floor of the supraspinatus fossa. So uh, this does, they, they figured out that this does not apply well to the base plate of the reverse because uh, we usually we put the base plate in the most inferior portion of the glenoid. So in the most inferior portion of the glenoid, usually is more superior, superiorly inclined than the whole inclination of the glenoid. Not sure if you're following or not. Yeah, it's of course, I, I do follow you. Yeah. I know the superior. So, 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 uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm talking about the, like, the audience. So, so, uh, so what, what we do now is almost always use wedges and, and keep the wedge superior to um, uh, increase the inferior inclination of the base plate. And, I, uh, and 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 uh, and base plate that base plates that have wedges, they consider that already lateralized. So we cannot lateralize more if we use the wedge. So this is what we always almost always use now. Yeah, and I, I believe that the uh, reason for failure in the X-ray because you know it, with the superior reverse shoulder angle, it's not accurate in the X-ray that you showed. So uh, I believe. This is one of the causes of failure of the, of the reverse shoulder. That you showed. And yeah, failure if you do. In the case I showed, the failure was in the humerus, not in the glenoid. Yeah, but, but is... I mean, it changed all the biomechanics. So, uh, uh, because all the studies showed that the most of the failure is not in the humerus side, it's in the glenoid side. So, mm -hmm. that's why mm -hmm. most of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, we don't use mm -hmm. a cement, we don't cement the, the mm -hmm. humerus stem because. They notice that uh, that the failure occurs in the on the in the unite side, not the humor side. And of course, mm -hmm. interestingly, uh, as you said, the reverse shoulder angle. That the first one who described that was Pascal Boileau a few mm -hmm. years ago, and he changed uh, his biological reverse shoulder from um, spherical or just uh, around to uh, to wedge. So now mm -hmm. he's taking a wedge of uh, of the bone from the human head, make it. Uh, larger superiority than inferior right mm -hmm. but yeah like uh, we do it here with with metal wedges not with bone graft wedges so uh uh and and in the case you were talking about so the uh, one of the other things that might have led uh to uh humor loosening was the because the like the initial x-ray showed that like the, the the cortex was not very good so either they should have Put like uh, inserted a, a bigger stem initially or cemented from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Like uh, uh, almost almost all of the cases, the primary cases we do here are uncemented. But in this case in particular, uh, maybe cement was uh, a good idea. I, I'm not sure, but this is what I would do. Okay, perfect. So there is another question to Dr. Muhammad. So uh, from the audience. Um, did you do any comparative study between double row repair and star repair for large cuff tear? And is there any difference in the retail rate to justify the increased cost and surgery time? So that was the question. Yes, this is a nice question. Firstly, we are running now a study about a comparison between double row and star repair. It is not available in the literature, uh, whether a star or triple row because this is a new modality, but practically, yes, I found the difference in my patients. I am very confident when doing the star repair and even in the follow-up, it yields very good results for me and very confident with the follow-up with the patient. Uh, but we are now running uh, this is, uh, study and this is also a PhD thesis of uh, our assistant lecturer, Hussein. Uh, uh, about the retail rate uh, to justify the increased cost. This is not actually the increased cost because one anchor among five anchors is not an increased cost because in double row you put four anchors and with the star repair you add one, just one more anchor. And even the surgery time, we said, yes, it is relative because you increase five to seven minutes more. This is not a surgery time. So for, for, for me, uh, in, in, in uh, all of my massive tears, I use the star repair and I, I have very good results with it. Perfect. 
So, um, um, actually, I think we have reached to the end of our webinar uh, tonight. I have a yeah, question I... for you, Dr. Ahmed and Deal. Uh, <laughs> so, what's 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 your indications for uh, shoulder hemis uh, versus reverses for fractures? Uh, the age, mainly the age. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, age 60 of course now we are we agree that we we're not going to do a uh, open reduction pin fixation for such a for such a fracture okay so uh, mm -hmm. now uh, if i um, if i decide to do hemi or reverse the age is the key factor for me mm -hmm. so i um, above 65 or 70 i would go for a reverse shoulder arthroplasty okay but the okay. problem here is also the cost Yes, you have to explain That's, to the patient that there is mm -hmm. a, a good function, but on the expense of the cost. Ma, and ma, I always explain to the patient we, that there I are two modalities. Here we, we talk academically. Yes. I no. mean, I mean, here in the webinar, we should uh, deliver a message. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, okay. from scientific point of view, yeah. of course, yeah. uh, of course uh, of people, we don't uh, have. We don't have the luxury, of course, to 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 do that in our patients, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. but many this is of how them life accept, goes. Many of them, many of them accept the reverse shoulder because they, when you explain to them to the function, they said okay. But this mm -hmm. is also an um, important issue to discuss, not only here, also in France, also in everywhere, because they mm -hmm. change concepts in France mm -hmm. to do uh, uh, with uh, with cuff arthropathy. To, uh, to go with physiotherapy and the scapular stabilizer exercises to avoid doing reverse arthroplasty because of the cost also. So reverse shoulder is a costly everywhere. Of course. But I think, I think here, we, uh, we, oh, our limitations also about the cost. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, uh, the patients, very both expensive. items, yes, both items, uh, uh, to, uh, and uh, they have to choose also. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for this nice uh, uh, webinar and uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, again in uh, such nice uh, meetings. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you, Dr. Yehabdir from the States. Stay safe, especially in the chaos that happened uh, <laughs> happening right now. And thank you, Professor Hamad Gamal. And welcome back. And alhamdulillah ala salamtak. Thank, thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.